Many the gifts, many the people, many the hearts that yearn to belong. Let us be servants to one another, making your kingdom come. Christ, be your light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gather today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord of life be with all of you. Thank you. And welcome to everybody that's come, and those who have tuned us in on the internet. For those of you who have tuned us in on the internet, in the comment field, there are links to some of the handouts that we just gave out to the people as they came into the church. Let us pray. Dear St. Joseph, when the Diocese of Buffalo was founded, it was placed under your protection. We turn to you now as our diocese is in great turmoil. For many, faith in your son Jesus is no longer priority, and many have left the church. The ravages of the pandemic, bankruptcy, and lawsuits have weakened our parishes. Now if you silently will mention your own intentions. Even though there are many problems and the road to healing is uncertain, we know that your intercession in heaven is powerful and that you will come to our aid. Spread your protective cloak around us. Protect us from fear, anger, despair, hopelessness. And fill us with wisdom, courage, trust in your Son for a bright future and love for each other and a willingness to work alongside you to strengthen the church in the Diocese of Buffalo. St. Joseph, come to our aid. St. Joseph, intercede with your son to send us a bishop who will shepherd us in all the aspects of the diocese, from spiritual to financial. A man whose heart longs to follow Jesus, the chief shepherd. We also ask that the priests and the people of the Diocese of Buffalo will be willing to work with the new bishop to strengthen the church, enable more individuals to come back to Jesus. St. Joseph, pray for us. Please be seated for the first reading. Actually, the only reading. But... A reading from the first book of Kings. Elijah went a day's journey into the desert until he came to a broom tree and sat beneath it. He prayed for death, saying, This is enough, O Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. He lay down and fell asleep under the broom tree. But then an angel touched him and ordered him to get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a hearth cake and a jug of water. After he ate and drank, he lay down again. But the angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him, and ordered, Get up and eat, else the journey will be too long for you. He got up ate and drank. Then, strengthened by that food, he walked forty days and forty nights to the mountain of God, Horeb. 
There he came to a cave where he took shelter. Then the Lord said to him, Go outside and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord will be passing by. A strong and heavy wind was rending the mountains and crushing rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a tiny whispering sound. When he heard this, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. A voice said to him, Elijah, why are you here? He replied, I have been most zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, but the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. The Lord said to him, Go, take the road back to the desert near Damascus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening. Good evening. Is that loud enough? People tell me I swallow the endings. If you can't hear me, just raise your hand at some point, then I'll remember. Don't swallow the endings. Yesterday was a great, great feast, one of the greatest feasts of the church year. It was October 4th. It was a Sunday. So Sunday, being the day of resurrection, always takes preference, so we celebrated the 27th Sunday of the church year. Does anybody know what October 4th celebrates also? Oh, good, wonderful, friends. Who do we celebrate on October 4th? St. Francis. Francis of Assisi. When we were called to reflect on what was already mentioned, there was only one thing that I could think of, because Father had us do some brainstorming, what, what could we do, how could we respond? But this little man just kept popping into my head, because I'm a Franciscan sister, and I've been one for a long time, and I've heard and learned so much about that man that I just felt almost pushed to suggest to Father that, well, maybe St. Francis could help us with the situation that we have now in the diocese. And people might say, yeah, 13th century, what does that have to do with this big technological age that we have now? It has a lot to do. The only thing that would probably change a lot would be all the technology and a lot more noise than Francis had in his century. But the situation of the church, the situation in the world, the financial situation was so similar that if we had time to go parallel it with Francis's time and our time, you'd see why I was just so excited really about reaching out to Francis for help with this. And, you know, sometimes we think we see pictures of the saints with their halos and everything like that. You know, they weren't born that way. Francis didn't, wasn't born with a tiny halo that just got bigger. On the contrary, uh, his parents never thought that there'd be a halo on his head. He didn't just drop from heaven. 
None of the saints did. He had a very long journey, a very difficult journey, before people would follow him and even listen to him. In fact, one of the biographers of Francis says repeatedly, oh, in the seventh year of his conversion, and then chapters later you're going to read, in the thirteenth year of his conversion, and then you have the eighteenth year of his conversion. This guy was in constant conversion. That's what we're called to do. Simply be turning to the Lord, turning to God, at times like this especially, but every day. And so Francis already is with us in that continual turning to God. He was born in a very influential family. His father was pretty well-to-do because he had a very successful um, cloth business. He traveled to France and brought beautiful things for women to use. Some of the women, not all. So there was money. And so Francis was able to just throw everything to the wind and have fun with his pals night after night, singing, dancing, and who knows what else. He didn't have a trouble in the world because dad could just take care of everything. His father, too, was a, a, because he was a merchant and a very well-to-do merchant, he was part of what was known as the bourgeois. The bourgeois were kind of like our Wall Street gangs. So there was another parallel. Had a lot of influence in the financial world, in military power. They had a lot of prestige. And his dad was in that. And his dad was, was hoping that Francis would follow in his footsteps. And we'll just skip over all the bourgeois problems and everything, but there was one thing that Francis also got very interested in, and it was the ideal of the hero. Medieval times had a lot of heroes, and it was almost the accepted thing for a young man to want to do something very heroic with his life. And that was in Francis's head, too. He didn't get too involved in the whole culture of chivalry, but when there was a call to arms, because the arch rival of Assisi was another town named Perugia. And there had to be a fight. That's how they settled things, too. So Francis, the hero, hopefully a hero, he gets all excited, and his parents spend anything he needs to send him off to war with the best horse, the best coat of mail, the best weapons, you name it, he had it didn't last very long. They didn't get too far, maybe one battle or two. And he and his pals were surrounded, they were conquered, and they were all taken prisoner. Francis is in his early 20s around this time. It wasn't an overnight stay in jail where daddy could come and bail you out because he had the money to do that. It lasted a whole year in very, very poor conditions. Medieval prisons were nothing like jail today. And so he had a lot of time to listen, to think, to reflect upon his life. Eventually, they are let go. Some of the biographers think that the, the parents did pay enough for, the, for them, their sons to get out. He goes back to Assisi, and it's, it's beautiful. Anybody here has been to Assisi? Okay, you know, you know. You just close your eyes, you see that. Beautiful, beautiful, Umbrian um, landscape and everything. But he goes back and nothing makes sense to him. His pals are calling him to come and drink and dance and sing. It's like, no, nothing. Something happened to him, his experience in that prison, which was very dark, very cold. He was very confused. He was also ill. So when he comes back, nothing makes sense. And a whole year passes during which he wanders around. People think that, well, PTSD or something, you know, poor guy, he's just not going to be the Francis that we knew. 
And he decides, well, maybe I'll try my hand at the military again. Fortunately, when he's on the way to another battle, he has a dream. A dream similar to Joseph's dream when he was confused about taking Mary as his wife, similar to the dream that St. Paul had on his way to Damascus, Francis heard a voice calling out to him. Someone was saying, Francis, where are you going? And he answers, to Perugia, to fight for Assisi. And the voice continued, from whom do you expect more, the master or the servant? And he answers, why, the master. And the voice asks, then why are you following the servant? He knows this is not just a voice. He senses in his heart, this is something life-changing. And he actually answers, Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? Similar to what you just heard from Elijah, when he has an encounter with Jesus, with, with God, he's told, go back. Go back to your country. We'll tell you what to do. Francis hears those exact words. Go back to your country, and we'll show you what you're supposed to do. Now, don't get the idea. He goes home. There's an email waiting for him with all the directions with what he's supposed to do. It took a lot of time again. Francis has to wait. He has to listen. For what? For something that's going to show him which direction his life should go. And one of the things that he did that time that we know, at that time, he walked around a lot, and beautiful, it's easy. There was a, a real rundown church, not like our beautiful church here. And in the church, there was a crucifix, much larger than the picture of the crucifix that we have here. And Francis loved that crucifix very much because if you, if you look closely, the eyes of Jesus seem to be looking right at you. And his arms are open in welcome and almost in victory. You notice that he's not hanging on the cross. He triumphed. And Francis prays before that crucifix church is abandoned, nobody's there, nobody's going to hear him. And he says, he, he prays what has become one of the most famous prayers for a Franciscan. He asks God, he addresses God, most high and glorious God, bring light to the darkness of my heart. We heard darkness in the song. We heard darkness in Elijah. There was darkness in Francis' life, as in our lives now. He asks for right faith, not in all kinds of temptations all around him. Right faith. He asks for a certain hope, not wishing. I wish this, I wish that. Wishing is not hope. Hope is solid. He asks for perfect charity. He continues, give me insight and wisdom that I might know your most holy will. How could God refuse him, right? When he's asking for the treasures that God wants to give us. So after years of waiting and listening, Francis seems to hear something in his own ears, and the crucifix continues to speak to, to Francis, and he actually hears the words, Francis, go. Elijah, go. He hears a direction, he hears a command, go. And what does he hear? Repair my church because it's falling into ruin. Do we feel anything like that about church, diocese? 
Do you see why Francis is talking to us? Francis, I mean, it's, I don't think it's just coincidence or provi it's providence that we're meeting and we're, we're turning around these ideas in our head the day after the world celebrates Francis of Assisi. Go and repair my church because it's falling into ruin. Well, Francis thinks this is it. Now I know what I'm supposed to do. So what does he grab? He gets stones, he gets mortar, he gets the instruments, and he starts repairing churches. He starts with San Damiano, the one that's falling apart, because it's right in front of him, and he thinks, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. He not only repairs San Damiano, but a number of other churches too. And this goes on for a couple of years. His poor father already has given up on him, you know, to see his son, his one and only, repairing churches when he wanted him to become a big businessman. But he does it because he was told, go repair my church. It took a long time, but it was a pivotal experience for Francis to hear that he was not being called to build the literal buildings, but he was called to repair the church of God. What is the church of God? Who are the people of God? Who, are, who is the church? The people, the people of God, who are turning away, sound familiar? Who are leaving it all because there were other things to go for. So Francis is called to repair the church. It took a long time for him to realize it wasn't with stones and mortar and other bricks, but it was with living stones. He realized that God was calling him to help people realize we are the ones that need to repair our own lives and the lives of those who are, are called by God also. So we're going to give you a stone. Okay, I bought some. They're not, uh, they're anything like, nothing like the stones that Francis had to use. But I'm going to ask you to take the stone home. Okay, if you want one for you and one for a friend, there's, there are plenty. Um, go ahead. Pass them around. And if you could place it in some spot in your home that would help you remember, that would put a little light on in your, in your head, in your family, that this is what we are all called to do, to build not with stones, but with our very lives, our souls, Francis took a long time in trying to understand what the building meant. And God was ready. God saw that he was ready because he was listening very much to the word of God. He goes to church one day, and it happens to be the, the Feast of St. Matthew. And the gospel that the priest reads that day is, if you want to be perfect, that was basically what Francis wanted. He wanted God's will for him. If you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Francis had probably heard that gospel. We've heard it year after year because it's read at least once during the church year. If you want to be perfect, this is what you should do. So Francis heard it, but this time it was different. This time, because Francis was listening for the tiny whisper of God. And so he goes to the priest after the Mass, and he said, could you explain this to me? Uh, it's, I'm not sure if I really understand what this means. And so the priest takes him word by word. He explains that gospel to him. And Francis, when it becomes very clear, he just bursts out and says, this is what I want to do. This is what God is calling me to do. So after the patient waiting, the listening to the word of God over and over, it's, it becomes clearer for Francis. 
even at that time, Francis doesn't realize, but he's going to have another two years sitting with this gospel. Repairing the church, repairing the people of God, repairing our souls is not a one-year endeavor. We, we need to be patient, but we need to be disciplined and working as we are trying and doing what we need for the repair to actually happen. Elijah did not hear anything in the wind. Couldn't God have used the wind? Powerful. Nothing happened with the earthquake. The tiny whisper. You don't hear a tiny whisper when you're talking 60 miles a minute or there's a lot of noise around you. We need to create a time for quiet, not only surrounding us, but within us. And Father's going to share right now with us a few suggestions that help us, that can help us create the listening attitude, the listening, the openness that we can develop as Francis did. So in a few moments, we're actually going to get into us listening to you, or me personally listening to you. But as Sister was saying with that point, we want to not just share what we feel or what we're thinking, but we really want it to be rooted in Christ. So just taking a few moments to just calm yourself down, taking a few deep breaths, sometimes using a sacred word. Um, and when I say word, I don't mean literally a word, but maybe a phrase, like the Jesus prayer. Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or any of those things. Just kind of take a few deep breaths, maybe close your eyes, and just... Let go of today. Let go of all that you might be thinking or feeling. And just ask the Lord to fill you like St. Francis did. St. Teresa of Avila talks about how our soul is a mansion, a crystal castle, and that really what prayer needs to do is drive us into the castle and into the inner chamber where we and God are one, and we leave all the noise, all the distractions behind us. So you might be, you've been sitting for a half an hour, so you might want to stand and stretch. In your folders, there are cards. So if you have comments, questions, concerns, you want to write on them. We're also going to be bringing around a microphone. So if you'd rather do it that way. Um, so if you want to just stand for a few moments, and then we're going to get into the most, for me, the most important part of today is listening. Like St. Francis did, Ezekiel did, St. Joseph did. And remember, you're not allowed to throw your rocks at me, okay? <laughs> this isn't Stone Father evening, okay? Stone. 
Since we have such a small group, and most of you are from the council itself, um, you know the basic rules. Respect each other. Don't interrupt each other. Listen to each other. Try to let each other, what each other is saying to you kind of sink deep inside of you. Um, do the members have, does someone have the baskets? Okay, that's all we need. The group is small enough. When you're ready, just kind of raise your hand or whatever, and you can just throw me your card. Not throw them, but any ideas? Any cards? No, no, no. Are we still writing? Good, good, good. I want to take this opportunity to let you know that I'm going to be running for president of the United States. So if you'd like to vote. <laughs> I said, I'm running for President of the United States. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't get up. Don't get up. I'll come to you. I'll come to you. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get my thousand steps in today, so. Oh, I didn't say you were. I just have to get my thousand steps in. Now, of course, you okay? There you go. Patrick, anything? No, 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 no. Okay. Okay. Does anybody want to actually just voice their, their comments? David, you have the microphone. Do you want to start? Do you have any comments or questions? No? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The church has... You have to hold oh. it up to your close... Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. We have been living through this pandemic. Everyone has been sad, scared, upset, and frightened. When we came back to church... We said prayers and sang songs of healing. And what we need to do now is move forward. We need to celebrate life. The funeral is over as far as the scandal goes. We need to sow love and joy. We need joy. We need happiness. We need to celebrate that Jesus is risen. He is not in the grave. He is with us every day. And we need to show the world that we're Catholic and that we love Jesus, and we love each other, and we're going to do it in joy and happiness, not in sorrow and renting of clothing. We need to be together and be happy that God is with us, not in sorrow. 25 years ago, my husband passed, it took me a long time to get over it. But I'm so happy I had him. And I'm happy to talk about him. We should be happy to speak about the Lord and know that he's risen 
and he's not in the grave, and neither is this church. None of us can stand to be in sorrow for seven months. It's hurting people. We need to sing songs of joy, not just healing, but joy and a lot of joy that we're still here. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think healing is first and foremost. Um, it seems that laity, you know, play a big part, but it means even more if it comes from the clergy or religious. And it seems that, in my estimation, there are a lot of people who aren't coming, who aren't giving. And this has, you know, been universal, actually. It's not only our parish. But it's wonderful to hear the laity call these people and see how they're doing and find out maybe why they're not coming, why they're not giving. But it seems that there would be more of an impact if the religious or the clergy would just pick up the phone and say, hi, I'm here for you. And, um, you know, it's that, that one and one that I think would be a tremendous beginning. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's, I'll do some of the comments that you wrote on the cards. Oh, sorry. Did you raise your hand? I got the card. I'd like to apologize for my phone going off. I have something to say that makes me sad because I have two children. One's going to be 29 and one just turned 26. Went to Catholic school. And what makes me sad is that when my son went to college, I gave him a rosary and I gave him a crucifix. And I said, put these in the back of your drawer so you know Jesus is there. And he said, Mom, there isn't a God. I said, yes, there is Matthew. There is a God. I want you to put these in your drawer so you know, God know, you know that God loves you. My daughter doesn't talk like that too much, but she does say things like that, but my, it really hurt me to, to listen to my son say that. And I always talked about God, and yet he'll tell me to this day, there is no God, and it hurts me. And I try to pray for him. And just, I was, you know, just needed to throw that out there. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just, I know, I've heard one thing frequently in this parish, a lot of parents have children that are not practicing. Uh, and I know that there must be, I should say, it must be a, a heartbreak for you. But don't, oh, I know it's easier said than done, but don't be afraid to challenge them. When they say to you, there is no God, then say, why? Why do you believe that? Why do you believe there's no God? And, and not get into an argument. The worst thing to do is get into family arguments. 
But if you challenge them with a question, and usually I say, ask the question, then duck. So when they throw the anger at you, it misses you. Um, and I do mean that. Because you, what you need to do, not just with the children and the bigger situations, you, we need to keep on planting seeds. And then when we plant seeds, sometimes people are revolting. They don't want the seeds. They don't want to hear it. They have a million more excuses. Um, I used to be a college chaplain at one point in my life, and I had professors at that university that would do anything that they could to make sure that when the students left their room, they no longer believed. And their beliefs were constantly under attack 24-7 in his room. Um, so what we do is we have to be the opposite of that force. We just plant seeds, and they're going to get upset, they're going to get, but we don't want an argument. That goes nowhere. But sometimes it's a challenging question. And I say that because what does Jesus do? Many times in the scriptures, when something is thrown at Jesus, Jesus throws back a question. He doesn't throw back, you're wrong, or that's not right, or you should think this way. He throws back a question. And questions can be very non-threatening in a lot of ways. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, we, we, one of the ideas that came up from the Zoom meeting for the area was um, Catholics Come Home program, which we used to run very frequently. It was a program designed to reach out to people like your children and just kind of invite them, say, you know what? Here, it's a night of coming, presentations, talks, laughter, food, whatever. And it was just designed to say, you know what, give us a second look. So that was one of the ideas that came up to redo in our area. Okay. Anything else before I... Um... Thank you. Yes, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, I think that we have to stop, as parents, blaming ourselves for our children not going to church. No. Um, you know, we've got kids that don't, you know, some of our kids don't go to church. We've, we brought them up uh, as best we could by going to Mass and, and teaching them our Catholic faith. And they're adults, and I think we just have to stop blaming ourselves. Um, as to, you know, what did I do to make them feel that way? Yeah. I, I agree a thousand percent with that. There are many other aspects that influence a child's life, not just the parents. So I agree. Don't, you shouldn't be blaming yourself. The only thing you should be, I think you should do, is periodically ask the Lord, is there something I can do to help them? Something I can do, something I can say, something I can send, something. But... Yeah, blame. No, because they're adults. I shared about the professors at the university. There's so many other influences that, that really eat away at their beliefs. Are we any closer to getting a full-time bishop in our diocese? I have, I have no insight into that. I know Bishop Scharfenberger has been in contact with the Papal Nuncio. The Papal Nuncio is the Pope's ambassador, really, to the United States. Um, and all he says is that they've been in constant dialogue. So I don't know if that means we're getting any closer or we're just still farther out there. Can we at least be given some of the considerations which lead to any changes? This will make us better equipped to move forward. Can we at least be given some of the considerations? You mean what will make the changes happen or what the changes are? If you mean what the changes are, we have no idea what they are. I. I I have no divine knowledge from Almighty God. And if you, want, if you listen to rumors, 
you have everything. You have rumors out there which state very clearly that 14 Holy Helpers is the untouchable, that we will not be touched at all. And you have other rumors out there that are saying that 14 Helpers is closing. So if you listen to rumors, you can pick whatever rumor you want. There's no, um, there's no facts out there. Um, if you're talking about considerations, like what, what will they be looking at? They're looking at how our parish is doing spiritually, how strong is it rooted in ministry, how much of it is reaching out, um, out of itself to help the larger community, how much his own ministry is, and then financial. So it's kind of looking at all the different aspects of spirituality, which includes uh, public spirituality, which would be liturgical celebrations like the Mass, but as well as private, what else is happening, are there missions, are there retreats, are there other things spiritually, then how well the organization is doing, how well are we doing financially. Um, the best way to prepare to be equipped to move forward is dig your heels in with Christ. Walk with Christ. That's why one of the sheets I gave you, suggestions for prayers, I put down the Stations of the Cross. Because the Stations of the Cross, which adorn every one of our churches, is a reminder to us that Jesus believed that somehow, some way, his Father was going to bring goodness out of it. And that's what kept him going through all the stations. Okay? Through all the suffering. So, definitely, as it was said earlier, Jesus is risen. He's our hope. He's the one we're digging to. If we hope not just to survive this transition, we must generally put our hope in the Lord. Absolutely. Absolutely. How about as a particular way realizing that we can survive by sharing resources with St. John the 23rd. Definitely, that's an interest, that definitely is we're going to have to start looking at other parishes and working together. Um, all of us redoing the same thing doesn't make sense. Like right now, almost every parish is looking at how do we do a religious education program on the internet. We're all trying to do something. We're all doing a little bit different, but we're all trying to do the same thing. So how do we work together with resources? John the 23rd in the past has worked with us. Um, Father John Stanton um, and us have done some things together. How about offering to share whatever, is, whatever it is we have to offer places like Harvest House, and not just St. Luke's. Um, yeah, we do, yeah. We do a lot with St. Luke's partially because we have many volunteers from our parish that go there. But we have reached out to Harvest House, especially with the bottle drive. The bottle drive was geared to boosting um, St. Luke's uh, um, Harvest House. Will we always, we have to celebrate who we are and where we're going. How will you, Father David, make certain we are heard? Many of us couldn't get on the other day, and our emails were not responded to, but one possible was overly represented. One parish was overly represented. We were represented very well in the Zoom meeting. We had a good number of our, our parishioners from our finance group, parish council, and a few parishioners there on it. Our parish was excellently represented there. Um, details and information from today's meeting and Thursday's meeting, I will compile to send downtown. I would not expect your emails to be answered. I would expect you just on the information to the diocese. But you have to figure, 156 parishes emailing the offices, they're not going to be able to respond to each email. So that doesn't mean it's not being heard, but don't expect a response.
Archer sees acknowledged that there are more single people in Western New York because they are okay divorced or separate okay the real uh, okay the question is how do you bring people into the church and if there's one theme that I have preached for 10 years now which probably all of you are sick and tired of hearing is bringing people into the church from the day I arrived the day I arrived I was told that the parish needs to cut out a mass and start changing its mass schedule and we have fewer people coming and it's time to realize that and from the day I got here I said I'm not cutting out a mass I'm not doing those things I am going to keep on encouraging my people to keep on asking to keep on trying to bring people back in so in November, which will be my 10th year with you, um, you'll know that that's been my common theme. How do we build the church? How do we not take things away? How do we build her? Okay? And because of the pandemic and for other reasons, it was time for me actually to cut the mass. Because even before the pandemic hit, you noticed that we had fewer people coming to church. It was already going down. Okay. Um, the scandal is or should be behind us. That's, it'd be nice if it was, but it's not. Uh, people got really hurt by the scandal, people who were disfranchised about us, people who really um, are still harboring the anger and all that. It's not behind us. Um, so we just, and the reason I say that is we just need to be sensitive to those people. The people who are still hurting, still aching. Um, and I mean both sides of the coin. I have a priest friend who has been accused. Um, and none of the facts match up. The parish that he was supposedly in, he was never in. The priest he was with, he was never stationed with. N nothing adds up. And yet, it's still considered a legal case. And it's still in the court, the legal courts, um, they have to be dealt with. So he's now, he's in limbo. So, I mean, so you look at the, those that were abused and the pain. You look at those that were falsely abused and the pain they have. Uh, and you're saying, okay, I wish this was over and done with, but it's, it's not. Um, the comment that was made earlier, we need healing. And that's really what we're talking about as a church. We're talking about how do we heal. Um, before I go on, and there are a few more of these, one of my questions is, how will we as 14 holy helpers heal others? And I, I really think that. I think that we as a parish, because of her healing powers, need to become a healing force again. And I know that probably sounds strange, but we were at one time. We were at one time a church where people flocked from all over Buffalo to come here to be healed. Since I've been here, there have been healings since then. And I've watched the, the saints miraculously work. So how do we now as church say that this is a gift we offer now to the larger community? And I don't have the answer to that. I wish I did. But I don't have the answer to that yet. Um, in this word, world, there is enough sorrow, anger, and pain. It it. We, as a church community, need to show joy and love. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to have hopefulness, a hopeful experience. We need to sing to the Lord of joy. He is risen. That's probably yours. Yep. Um, 
I cannot agree more than that. As we walk around with so many people hanging their heads low, it's, it's time to be a joyful people. Um, St. Teresa of Avila, if I'm, hopefully I'm going to quote her right on this one. She used to pray to the Lord, save me from soured face saints. And, and what, is, what did Pope Francis do in one of his earliest documents to work? The joy of the gospel. The gospel is what brings us hope. The gospel is what tells us God is alive. The gospel is what tells us the Lord is walking with us. The gospel is tells us that the, the power of the resurrection is real. The gospel is the power of hope. And unfortunately, sometimes we can look at the gospel and say, okay, I take this line out here, or I take that line out here, or, or I look at the gospel and says, be perfect as your Heavenly Father, and, and then I go and get depressed on it and everything else. And, and what Jesus is saying, when you look at the gospels, they are, God, they are a message of hope. They're not a, a stick to beat you over the head with. They're a message of hope. The, the father and the prodigal son story is a great message of hope. God the Father always takes care of the good and the bad. It's a great um, message of hope. So we have to be careful ourselves because it's really tempted to do that where we can take a line or a quote out of Scripture and then we get beat ourselves up with. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is the whole. Okay, reviewing the website's survey created a two-fold problem. Responses require an essay-type response, and there's no room for that. The written response may then be subject to interpretation by some... Well, yeah, that always happens. I mean, even everything I'm saying tonight is, I'm sure, being interpreted by you as you're hearing it. I mean... That's, that's always there. How, what they're doing, I mean, how, my understanding, this is all based on my understanding. My understanding is they're trying to understand the diocese, and as the diocese is going to have to be pretty much restructured, what's the best way to do this? What's the best way to do this? That's, and it's not about money. As you probably know, Chapter 11, bankruptcy, is restructuring bankruptcy. What you do is you go to the courts and you go to your debtors and you say, you know what, we can't afford to pay all of our debtors. But we don't want you to shut us down. We can go, just go plain bankrupt. And then what you do is you shut down everything and you sell everything and then you pay off your debtors. But we don't want that. So we filed, not we, the diocese filed Chapter 11. Chapter 11 says, we need you to leave us enough resources to restructure ourselves so we can continue well into the future. That's what chapter 11 is. Now, I, so, so the heart of the diocese, the, the chancery, the offices, all those things, all those are being restructured. Drastically, they've laid off people. They've closed down departments. I mean, 795 Main Street, which is our central offices, is like a ghost town. Floors now are empty. Literally empty. Services that were offered are gone. Because they're slashing everywhere they can. Um, the money that we'll pay for our, our, our assessments to the diocese is less this year than last year. They're not trying to get more money out of us because they understand because of COVID-19, we have less money. So those, the amount that we're required to pay the diocese for services are left has been lowered. So, I mean, so they're trying to think of everybody, they're thinking of the parishes, they're trying to think of the diocesan offices and the whole concept of restructuring. Um, so that's what's happening. So that's, 
So the idea is, I got sidetracked, sorry. So the idea with that last comment is that they're looking at the diocese and saying, we want input, we want to hear what you're saying, we want to know what your strengths are, we want to know what your weaknesses are. So we can take your weaknesses and put you with a group that is strong in those areas and other churches that are weak in the areas that you're strong in, we want to be able to connect you with them. So everybody, the best example I can give is marriage. Marriage. And I tell this to couples. Your differences will either drive you apart or will strengthen your marriage. Because, you're diff because opposites attract. You all know that. All of you who have been married know that. I'm seeing some smiles underneath your masks. So, if you have an extrovert and introvert, and they really work together, the introvert is moved to an area where the introvert becomes more of an extrovert, never becomes an extrovert, but moves in that direction. The introvert moves more towards being, an, the extrovert moves more towards being introvert. And as they move closer together, both of them become enriched. And both their lives become enriched. And the marriage becomes enriched. Well, that's what's happening here. How can parishes work together so both become enriched? Not how do we shut down this one and hopefully put money over here so one of them can survive. No. How can both communities become enriched? That's what they're trying to figure out. So don't think the data we're sending down is being used towards who do we close. The data we're sending down in this journey to renewal, as I understand it, is how does everybody get enriched by the process? Since we do not have a permanent bishop now at this time, why is this happening now? Partially because of the bankruptcy. Partially because of the bankruptcy. Because what happens is the diocese has to present a plan to the courts on how we're restructuring. Or the courts tell us how we're restructuring. And we don't want that. So part of what has to happen now is that we need to move in this direction and say, okay. So when the courts look at us, they can say, yes, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're coming up with a viable plan that's going to keep them viable well into the future. So part of that's now. Part of it's because of the, the virus that has damaged us. And we're struggling to some degree with how many people we can have in church. But look at the country parishes. The country parishes, even though you're allowed 25 to 35%, their churches are so small to keep social distancing, they're like at 8% of their parishioners can come back. So, I mean, they're even having, I mean, they're struggling worse than we are. So the idea, so that now plays into why do we need to support each other to get each other through it. So the, the virus throws in an issue here. Okay? And the other thing too is, let's face it, we should have done this years ago. Years ago, instead of each of the parishes saying, it's us against you, it should have been, it's us together. And for too many years, we've drawn lines in the sand. And part of that I understand. Part of that's because, well, you were from that part of the old country. And we were from this part of the old country. So we don't talk to you because of the feud that happened in the old country that nobody remembers. And believe me, that's true. Or I was, a, I was connected when I was a seminarian with a parish. And I said, I didn't understand why we have all these Native American Indians coming to our parish which is so many miles away from the reservation, 
and we, they don't go to the church that's a quarter of a mile from the reservation. And I was clearly instructed. The people in the church that was a quarter of a mile away from the reservation said, your kind is not welcomed here. You go there. And the other church, which was a good distance away from the reservation, had their arms wide open saying, hey, come on in. So all that little bickering that happens between our little parishes for years have hurt us, have hurt us terribly. So if I was in charge, I would, I don't know if this is the best time, but it seems like the hand of all the situations have now forced us into something that has to be done. Yes, Jamie. This way, everybody in the back can hear you. Thank you, Father. Um, what I was going to say, I had a lot of things I wanted to say tonight, but we're covering so much. So, But when Father was saying that, that's the unfortunate thing about some churches. It's not a lot of people, but certain people don't like certain people and whatever. One thing I can say, I did not grow up in this parish. I came here 23 years ago after my mom passed um my mom went in a nursing home. My dad passed away, and I came, moved to Buffalo. I didn't know anybody here, and I met Patrick, and I joined the choir, and I met other people here. The one thing we really do have going for us as a parish, you know, they, we talk about, you know, they're, are they going to judge our financials or this or that? This is a very friendly family of people. And I think that the people in our parish should be very proud of that. It's something, of course, we can always work on. But we have an, a remarkably, truly Christian, warm, friendly bunch of people here. And I think if there's any way we, you know, who knows what this journey is going to involve. I know that we have a lot of people here that are very involved, that are very willing to help with whatever. And if we can market ourselves in any way, on a human level, I say we push to tell, make sure people understand 14 Holy Helpers is a true Christian family, and that's what parish is about, and doesn't matter your race or your age or whatever, you are welcome here. And I think that's something that, that I can feel, I know my friends can feel it, and I think it's very important. So, so that is one really great thing that we have going for us, and I think we should be very grateful and just keep working on that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. This is one of the comments that came into the Internet. People die every day. I nearly died December 7th, year 2018. God spared me. Not a day goes by that I don't thank him for hearing prayers that we, were said for me. Very nice. The bottom line is not all about financials and demographics. The ultimate bottom line church is faith. We have faith in Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. We, the people of God, like Peter, are the rock foundation upon which Christ builds his church. If we treasure, listen to each other, and learn from one another, we can revitalize and grow our community. Then all other things will fall into place. Very good. I mean, Christ is our rock foundation. And the key, and it's going to become on the next one as well, positive and effective change can only happen when people listen to and respect one another. True leadership resources, empowering people, and tapping into their talents and ideas. And, and that we've heard so often tonight. Respecting each other, listening to each other, trying to heal each other, trying to bring Christ to each other, 
focusing on Christ as we go forward. Other comments? Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> David. When I first read about all this with renewal and everything, I thought, boy, this is bad timing. Really bad timing, because we can't even get our people back to the church that are normally here every weekend. They're staying at home watching it on TV because it's very comfy. And I, I mean, I stayed home and watched it in the very beginning also. But I missed getting the uh, Holy Eucharist at communion. I missed being with my family from 14. Some of these people don't care. I think we're going to lose a lot of people in the end anyways, no matter. I mean, we pray for them. We have hope that it won't happen that way. But I think we are going to lose a lot of people, which is going to hurt us. And I don't want anybody to get down because of that remark. That's my own personal feeling. Um, people just, uh, like I said, when this COVID ends, what are they going to really do? Well, I don't know if it will end, but I almost feel they should be coming back to church now. I know it's the law or the governor or whoever says we can't come back in groups. And like, it's smaller than, be closer than we can normally be. But, uh, I don't know. I just don't see an urge from the people that I have seen uh, that have been sitting at home. And I, I'm not pointing at any elderly people. I came from a very elderly parish before. And uh, we closed. Not to say that I, I think we've got a lot more going here that we would, I, I don't even enter in my mind about closing here. But I just thought this was a very bad timing. I've been in the stewardship. I've been in renewal in the parish. I've been in anything that came down the line just to kind of work with people. And a lot of them will just say, I watch TV on, I watch mass on the TV. I pray to God. I talk to him every day. And I said, but the, my main purpose is, that I go and receive him. And I feel we all should be doing that and listening to his word. But a lot of them do say that. I'm a good Catholic. I believe I'm good. I was baptized. I was this, I was that. And I listen to Mass on TV, and I do, you know, say my prayers and talk to God. Those are tough answers to give to people like that. I think, um, just kind of responding to that, uh, it came up at the parish council um, meeting, my last parish council meeting, that one of the saddest things you don't see is people don't hunger for the Eucharist. And the, the hungering that needs to happen um, that would drive them back. Or, or they say, you know what, okay, I watch on TV, but I can't wait for the day I can get back. For, for a group, that's not there. Now, on the positive side, from what I've been told, there are more seekers who are seeking Christ now, or at least seeking God. Let me word it that way. Seeking God now more than ever because of the pandemic. I, I've talked to some younger men who, with, who have told me their friends now are seeking, they're seeking God because they're trying to seek some kind of understanding to this pandemic and all that's happening in the world and the violence and everything, the whole, the whole problem of the world. So we got two extremes happening. We have ones that were saying, I'm a good Catholic, but it's okay just to pop it on TV. And we have other ones that are saying, what do I need to do to find this, this God or this Jesus because I need, I need some meaning in my life because I can't go like this anymore. So... Yes. I had a, a thought um, about all this stuff. Um, about 10 years ago, I was talking with a man who was very discouraged about the church and, and things like that. And, and me personally, I, 
I like to observe people, and I like to observe people dipping their hand in holy water as they're entering or leaving the church. And you know what I observe more than, than anything? I observe people pretending to dip their hand in holy water, never touching it, and going up and doing the sign of the cross, never touching the holy water. And after, after telling him this, I said, you know what we need? This is 10 years ago. We need, we need to have less churches. We need, to, we need to go back to when you have to travel to go to church. I, I want there to be no churches for 100 miles, is what I told them. I want people to have to travel 100 miles to go to church. That's when you're going to start to see people of faith in action. You're not going to have that when you can wake up, throw on a pair of shorts, throw on a, your flip-flops, and come walking into church any hour of the day. If you want people to grow in faith, make it difficult for them. So I'm kind of happy this is all happening. Because for me personally, it's kind of what I wanted. <laughs> I, I like to see people struggle because it's out of the struggles that people are going to start to really question whether or not this is real. Is, this, is God real? Is Jesus really in the Eucharist? Is, is holy water really something we should be dipping our hands into? And, or should we just pretend to dip our hands into it? Just to, just to show like you're, you're a believer. So for me personally, I love to see people grow in their faith, but it's not going to happen when things are easy. It's only going to happen when things are hard. So that's just my thing. Okay. Question that came in. In order to grow the parish, is this parish prepared to embrace the needed change to attract families? It's kind of interesting to wonder, and I know this person is listening on the internet right now. Um, you might want to send me another comment. What are the changes that you think we need to do? Uh, one of the changes that I know we need to do is make sure that everybody is comfortable with kids in the church. And then there some people aren't. Sometimes you have a crying baby or whatever, and, and you can see on people's faces... Um, that they're not comfortable with that. Um, we had our children's liturgy. We're moving back to a once a month, a month breakfast and event in the hall. Um, so in that sense, we've tried to move back. Um, music, we've tried to, at least at the 12 noon mass, try to zazz it up a little bit. Um, but the, and I'm not whoever you are that sent this in. Um, I'm not putting you down because I know myself there's more we could do. There's a lot more we could do for the parish, for families. Um, but I also need families to be willing to come forward. And it's a two-edged sword. Um, some of you, some of you, um, just one second, Sue. Some of you that heard my homily last week, I started by saying, do you trust me? Do you really trust me? Because I began to understand, and yes, I am a slow learner, but I'm beginning to understand that unless your people trust you, they're not willing to step forward with you. And I think about all the things I've preached over the years, and some of the things I've preached, I know I've tried to get you to grow, but you've got to trust me then to walk with me. And, and I've heard over and over again, I just heard it the other day, where another person, I tried to get them to grow a little bit, and they said, look at Father, I'm from the old school. I, I, I don't get to any of that new stuff. And I said, well, what I'm asking, what I'm telling you changed in 1974. The church changed in 1974. And what it was was on the sacrament of the sick. 
And the reason, and I said to the woman, I said, the reason I'm trying to say this to you is because of what I, am, I heard, because all these months that your husband's been deteriorating, you've never called for the sacrament. Now that he's almost at death's door, it's like, okay, Father, run over and anoint him. I wanted him to have all, all the graces he needed all those months, as well as now. As well as now. And, and, and I guess that's part of what hit me was like, well, if you don't trust Father, you can get in the pulpit and say, this sacrament changed, and you'd say, ah, I'm on the old school. I don't believe that stuff. Or do you trust me? And not just me. Do you trust the church? And let's face it, we've made mistakes. We as a church have made many mistakes. And that's why I think one of the biggest things people have to realize is the church has a divine head but a human body. And so it's, you have to be willing to say, okay, the Lord is working with our feeble conditions. She's not, the bride of Christ is not perfect. She is not spotless. She has her mistakes. She has her faults. But what does the scripture say about the bride? And I'm leaning a little bit on the bride in the Old Testament image. Jesus says, I will take you, I will wash you, I will cleanse you, I will clothe you, I will put a diadem on your head, I will draw you to myself with strings of love, I will pull you into my heart. That's the image of God and his bride. And, and, and that's, that's the image. So we struggle as church. And we always will. Um, anyway, to the person that sent in the question, send me your ideas. And to anybody that's in the pews, send me your ideas. And send me your gifts and your talents that you want to move forward. Oh, I got it. I am the one who's been staying home because of my age and health. My family, who lives in town, I have only seen four times in the past six months. They are concerned about me and afraid if I get COVID, I would not survive. Miss the Mass, the Eucharist, and the people. Life gets lonely, but we, can, but we do the best we can. Thank you. And there are people like you that I know that are in that boat. And I've met them. Not everybody who's staying home is... Um, one second. Sue had her hand up earlier. Sue, you were in... The... I just want to say... Thank you. First of all, um, we need to get the, the young people back into this church. I've noticed when we volunteer for things, there are just a few people that are always there at everything, but we need to get the youth in here because we're the last generation now that is going to carry this church, and we're all getting old. I mean, I'm almost 60 myself, so we need to do that. Also, we need to be open to change. I've worked for companies where the people say, well, we've been doing this for years. Well, that's nice, but things need to change, and we need to be open to them. I'll have to say. Thank you. David, you had your hand up. Regarding that lady in the last card, um, and David here, um, saying maybe it should be hard to get this. I think this COVID thing has actually done that. Maybe not in miles, but in rules and regulations. And people I think you can see are missing being here at Mass. 
especially the elderly. Um, the other thing was the Eucharist. Uh, not being able to receive the Eucharist, especially around Easter, um, I think was a big blow for people. And um, I know that um, John 6 is one of my favorite Gospels, all about the Eucharist, uh, the whole chapter. Um, but leading up to uh, verse 66, where a whole group of disciples leave him over the Eucharist, over the doctrine of the Eucharist. They walk away, and he asks his disciples, will you two go? Of course they don't. We don't understand, but we're not leaving. Well, some of the ch teachings in the church are difficult to accept and difficult to understand. And I think, um, for instance, um, the culture, I've seen it, I'm 75, I've seen it through the 50s, the decay of the culture, and I think it's crept into the church through members of the church. And I believe that, uh, for instance, uh, the truth will set you free. That's what Christ said. I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. You know the truth will set you free. The truth. I think the truth is sometimes uh, not being preached forcefully and honestly and fully to people because of this uh, lack of attendance, this drop in attendance. I think people, I think some of the clergy and the church, generally speaking, Father, I'm saying, are afraid to speak some of the truths that contradict the culture. Homosexual actions. I'm not talking about the feelings and the urges. I'm talking about the actions are against God's law. God made men male and female in Genesis. All right? Um, the attack on marriage, free love in the 60s, uh, premarital sex, that's wrong. That's, is it being preached? Are we afraid that they're going to walk away like those disciples did over the Eucharist? I think it's just my personal feelings that uh, some people will walk away, but other people will gravitate to the truth. They'll accept it, the hard truth. That's just my thoughts. Um, I'm actually, I, I was debating whether I should respond or not respond. Some of the times those truths to me are better to be dealt with in the confessional or the one-on-one -on -one than in the church itself. Because most of my congregation is pretty much living those truths. So for me to get up on Sunday, next Sunday, and say, okay, I'm going to do a, a homily on homosexuality, and I could be wrong, though. Maybe that's what I need. Maybe I need to do something like that so they could take it to their children or whatever. I don't know. I don't see it as I'd rather have someone come to me one-on-one -on -one and deal with it. Or when I was at the college campus, that was a lot more challenging when I would preach to the college kids. I wasn't referring to I, I'm, I, I'm not. I'm just saying because I think other priests come from where I'm coming from, too. That's all I'm saying. So... Um, it's true, though. I mean, it's always a struggle. And it's also, and, and you've heard me say this once in a while, every blue moon, I wish I was a Baptist minister. Yeah, I do. Hallelujah! All right! Yeah, hallelujah! There you go. Okay, there you go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Not hey. the uh, other group that plays on Sunday, which I don't usually go to with their band, but I think we need a young group to band. And even if us old folks have to take part in getting the instrumental piece, people there and come out with a song. Okay, let me get back to my point about being a Baptist minister. Before, and then we'll talk about your point. That's okay. Only because, and it doesn't have to be a Baptist minister, but there are other ministers that you get to preach an hour on a Sunday. I mean, and I wouldn't want to ever preach an hour, even though I am long-winded. But 30 minutes, so you can really get into a topic and really open it up and really break into the scriptures and really deal with the issue and really, I mean, what a great gift that is. Now I know, and I know my people, and this is true in every church I've been at, so I'm not picking on 14 helpers. I know when I hit the 10-minute mark, noise starts increasing in the church. Books are dropping. Well, of course, now they know books, so I'm better off now. Kneelers start to fall. And then when you start getting to the 13-minute mark, it starts getting more, more noise and who's getting up to go to the bathroom. And you just watch it happen. You just watch it. You, I know I don't have to look at the clock to judge my homily as much as I can just listen and watch my, my congregation. To have a chance to just say to you, you know what, these scriptures are so great today, we really need to break them open. We need to talk about them. We need to talk about this connection with that connection, that scripture, and, and that life, and that issue that's happening, and uh, how great that would be. Um, and, and I want to say this. I, I had a friend that was, his congregation was Catholic, but they were really more like a Protestant mindset, Catholic. So if he preached less than 30 minutes, they'd come up to him after Mass and say, so you weren't prepared today. What was wrong? Why didn't you get prepared? Yeah, but I'm just saying, can you imagine if I next Sunday preached 30 minutes, what would happen? Yeah. Well, the other thing which is interesting, too, is it's interesting now that we put in the bolts on what priest is doing what mass because the congregation has asked for the know where people are at. So. So, but you know what? If that helps them pray, I don't have a problem with it. If you, if the other priest really connects with you, then go ahead. Because you see, I grew up in a parish that had four priests. And when you have four priests in a parish, it's so easy to connect to one of the four. When you have problems, you knew who you would go to. Some would go to the pastor. Some wouldn't go to the pastor. Some would go to, I mean, I knew who to go to. When I had problems as a teenager, I knew who to go to. Nowadays, you're stuck. You got me. No, but seriously, you're stuck. Because some people with problems couldn't, couldn't talk to me. And I understand that. Because I knew what it was like. And that was one of the problems of having so few priests. As you watch that deterioration happen, and then priests would be able to... You have one priest in the parish that really took care of the youth. And you have one priest in the parish that really took care of the finances. And one priest that really took care of the ladies' guild and the holy name. You have one, I mean, you had it. And you have four priests at the dinner table sharing ideas, talking things out, encouraging one another. And then in your schools, you have the religious sisters. God bless the religious sisters. Our hospitals were run by them. Our schools were run by them. The faith was passed on by them. I'll bet you you can talk to almost every priest, except maybe the younger ones, and they'll tell you that a religious sister had part of their voc helped them in their vocation. I can. Sister Mary Ann Huffling played a very important role in my vocation. Sister Alma, Sister Eugene, Sister Alma was only this tall. 
Sister Eugene, if you sneezed, she would fall over. And where were they? They were in the inner city with the rough kids running a rough school and, and taking care of them. And one little side story, which is kind of funny, but I think I'll tell you, is that at one time the kids were ready to pin sister against the wall, but the pastor was walking through. And he had muscles on him like you wouldn't believe. He picked the kid up and put him against the wall, and his feet were dangling. <laughs> and he says, you will behave. But even that... So did his sisters leave? No, they didn't leave. They still stayed in the inner city. I remember the number of converts they had. Converts galore. Kids wanting to be Catholics. But most of the school was not Catholic. But God bless those sisters. God bless what they did. I mean, when people say to me, well, women want a role in the church, I understand that. We also understand the great role they had. Because the church wouldn't be where it is today if it wasn't for those sisters. It wouldn't be. Never would be. They were the backbone. And the youth, they're a whole different problem right now. I mean, I, I, I saw one of our, our young adults no, he's not a young adult. He's a high school kid. And I said to him, Oh, so it's so nice to see that you're back to church. He looked at me and said, Well, we go every week, Father. I said, Well, I haven't seen you. He said, Yeah, it's been months since we've come back here, but we've been going to St. Gabe's and Queen of Heaven and St. John Vianney, and we've been going. And he listed like 10 parishes. And that's a norm. That's a norm before the pandemic hit. That was becoming a norm. No commitment to one parish. So they're a whole different issue. Why? Because if you aren't committed to a parish, then you're not willing to use your talents. So when I asked the kids, when I used to go to their plays, and I said, wow, you really play beautiful. I want you to play at our mass. I want you to bring the flute, the, the bow, the... the Oh, no, Father, I can't do that. I'm too busy on the weekends. I can't do anything. I can't make a commitment like that. I want you to sing in our choir. can't do that. So, yes, Stella, I would love a youth choir and I'd love a youth mass. As a matter of fact, I had a woman who was going to do a youth choir for us until the pandemic hit. But trying to get the kids to commit. Oh, no, I go everywhere. I'm, I'm a Catholic. I go to church every weekend, but I go everywhere. Now, would they ever bring that back with uh, trying to restructure the diocese where you are in one zone and bound to that parish? Or it, years ago, it was absolutely. Yeah. You are saying that like one, one, like one whole area would be youth or something? Hold on, hold on. Let, me, let, me, let her repeat it. Repeat it, please. Okay. I uh, hear years you. ago, they used to have where you belonged in, if in a certain area, you belonged to that parish. Oh, yeah. And you were kind of, that's it. You go there. And then, nowadays, like you say, we had them wandering all over the place, even though they might be from this area. Do you think the diocese? No, because people, it's people who made the choice. I still have territorial. By canon law, I still have a region that I am responsible for. So I still have my territory. But, but for people... What? I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted. I just yeah. wanted to know if she means that you make it mandatory that people go to their well, churches. That's how it used to be. You, when you lived within these streets, you lived in the territory. Because by canon law, if you looked at the, our parish region 
anything within those borders I am spiritually responsible for. All the people in those areas. Whether they're Catholic or not Catholic, whether it's a nursing home, a hospital, whatever, I am responsible for the spiritual well-being of it. But it's the people who change the, not the laws of the church that change, it was the people. People would go wherever they want to go. I like this priest, I like that priest. I follow this priest, I follow that priest. I like this person. So people just, so fluid now. Ginny, were you going to say something? Good job. Oh, yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. And what Stella was relating, like our parish, 14 Holy Helpers, the boundary was my family's house on Indian Church Road and what was St. William's and now was Blessed John the 23rd was the other side of my parents' house all the way up to the other side, uh, up to um, the Buffalo Creek Creek. So, yeah, that was like the division. And then Queen of Heaven was the other way. You're talking about youth. <laughs> and they're a big part, of course, of our entire universe. But we know, our family knows quite a few uh, youth ministers in different parishes. And they're having the same problems. There's absolutely no way, you know, kids are coming. And you go back to, you know, what's a priority? Today, kids' priority is, or was before even the pandemic, sports, music, dance, you know, everything that he had to do with everything other than church. And what was presented at church, you know, wasn't up to their speed. And parents also honored that. So you got a combination of everything, but, you know, it's, it's a universal problem today. It's not something that's just, you know, concentrated in one area. And uh, just getting back, too, to what Ginny was saying, Queen of Heaven, before it began, was, par was 14 Holy Helpers. Queen of Heaven was an offshoot of 14 Holy Helpers because of the number of people that were coming. And uh, it's really not that many years that they have been in existence. So... Um, West Seneca, 14 Holy Helpers is the mother church of West Seneca. And it's not because of my brother. <laughs> I, we knew this from before. <laughs> so sorry, Tom, but you don't, can't take credit for that. <laughs> but I also want to say that 14 Holy Helpers, as Stella said, is very, very friendly. I mean, people say hello to each other, they do whatever, even through masks, and you know who's who even through masks. And in many areas, that's, you know, that's a real accomplishment. So, Father, I think, you know, you are the pastor, you are the first and foremost in our lives, and uh, I think we need to thank you very much for what you're doing. Well, my, my line is always a pastor is only as good as his parishioners that are behind him. So thank you, because you make me look good. So, okay. Yes. church and I'm very very proud that I grew up in this church and did for my whole life and that's all I want to say it's just this is a wonderful church and it was a big part of my life thank you thank you for sharing that 
Okay. So what I'm going to do at this point, um, just a few very quick things. One of which is, and you don't need to take out your folders, but I'm going to run you through what's in the folder. The original letter from Bishop Scharfenberger and the 10 points, or 12 points, I didn't count them, uh, about the whole process. The letter from me, which has in it what I promised to do for you and what I'm asking you to do for the parish um, about staying positive, staying faith-filled. You can read that later. The prayer that I use today, the St. Joseph, is a special prayer written for our diocese of not just what's happening, but the bottom half is about the selection of our bishop. Um, I would suggest, encourage you to pray it, if you so do it. You also have in there some good points to keep in mind when you're dialoguing with other people. Try to hear what God is saying. Try to listen. I will review everything tonight again. Um, I first started taking notes in the beginning. So some of you saw me writing. And I thought, wait a minute. This is being recorded. I can watch it later. So let me, so let me, so let me listen. Let me listen and not take notes. Um, and at this time, to kind of wrap up the night, um, Sister will lead us in the prayer of St. Francis. Um, and you'll see that it's a little bit different. It's, uh, it will have the line from the prayer and then a little reflection with it. And we'll work through it. And then I'll give a final blessing. Uh, one more thing. Sorry, I forgot something. I, I need a copy. This is not here, the here. same formula. That it's the same thing, but I think it's broken up. It should be right in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a new email set up for you. It's called Parish Input. Pretty much every day, every other day, at least, I will be checking it. So any input that you want to send me, ideas about the youth, the ideas about bringing back your children, ideas about what's going on, your worries, your frustrations, whatever it is, shoot it to me that way. If you don't have email, um, on the outside of the envelope, either write parish input or road to renewal. And that will, have, that will give special attention to me so you can keep in contact with me. You want to send comments to the, to the diocesan offices? It's right in there. Um, I think it's renewal at buffalodiocese.org. If you want to take the survey to put your input in, you have to have the internet, of course, and it's road to renewal.org. Yesp.org. Okay. That information is in there on the sheet with my letter. My letter is at the top, and that's on the bottom part. Um, I, I have, and I think you know this already, I have dedicated myself to walk with you. Um, I will do all that I can to be. Um, I'm wearing the school jacket. I don't know if any of you noticed that. Um, and the reason I wore it tonight is because the school motto is virtue and truth. All the logos, all the times it was put out, is virtue and truth. And I'll do my best to be virtuous, and I do my best to always give you the truth as I know it. Okay? So are you set? Do you want them to read that with you, or you want to just read it to them? No, we're going to do it together, but we're going to do it a little differently than the whole thing all together. Okay, okay. You all ha they all have They it. all have it, so okay. take it out. You all have a, just a plain white sheet. It says the prayer of St. Francis, a reflection on the prayer of St. Francis. Okay, we're going to do it like this. Instead of everybody doing the whole thing and getting lost, okay, my left, my right. Okay, the first paragraph, left, right, left, right, and then it's left, and the last one we'll do all together, okay? It's kind of like it, the, the chanting, the praying of the, of the divine of the sounds, in the morning. Yeah. You go one side, the other side, okay? So um, I know there's more there, but just let's do it. 
There's enough here. Okay, you're fine. Uh, let's begin. Let's begin um, uh, focusing to on on the patient listening that Francis had. This man is not dead. That saint is not dead, and neither are they. I, I was wondering why we ha well. You can't do everything in one night, but. We have the greatest uh, 14. Most parishes have St. Joseph's, uh, Blessed Angela, St. Hyacinth, one patron, right? We've got 14. That's a lot of power. And um, I, I'm, I'm new. I'm still new to the parish here, okay? But these saints, whenever I share the little booklet, uh, on the 14 helpers with other people, they are just amazed at the power in the parish with these intercessors. So if anybody can help us, I mean, St. Francis is first in my life, okay? But the 14 holy helpers, I mean, I really think we need to draw from their power. They have a lot. Okay, so we'll focus on the peace that God wants to give each one of us, our church, our diocese. So this left side. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. When politics tempt me to hate the other side, when my envy delights in workplace intrigue, when my thoughts walk the paths of anger's edge, Teach me to love as you have loved me. Where there is injury, pardon. When words cut sharp as knives. When idle gossip tears apart. When careless deeds wound deep. Teach me to pardon and heal as you have healed and pardoned me. Where there is despair, hope. Teach me, Lord, to hope when I'm unsure of many things, to trust when I want so much to give up, to believe when I'm confused and lost in doubt, and teach me to share your truth and my hope in you with those who struggle or have none. Where there is darkness, light, teach me, Lord, to trust in your light when I cannot find it, to walk by your light when the shadow beckons, to stand firm in your light when darkness threatens, to share your light and its warmth with all who seek it. Where there is sadness, joy, lighten my heart with the gifts of your spirit, touch my heart's ache with the peace of your presence, Lift my heart's burden and free me to share the gift of your joy, the joy of your grace together. O oh, divine, divine Master, Master help me find my peace in making peace with others. Help me come to know your love in learning to those I, I know. And let the needs of others' hearts help me to learn what I most need. Teach me to give from my heart as your heart gives to me. Teach me to pardon others as freely as you forgive me. And deepen my faith that in your dying, I rise to life forever with you. With Brother Francis, I offer this prayer, my God, this morning, this day, and all through the days ahead. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you for the discussion. Um, and we will continue discussion going forward. And be at peace. Be at peace. There's nothing to worry about. We're going to focus on Jesus, our risen Lord, and it's going to work out. All righty. Thank you. And remember, you can take home your rocks to remind you. Um, you can keep the pens.
our, our 59 cent gift to you. <laughs> Don't forget to let the rock remind you that you are the living stones yeah, yeah. for the church, for, for the diocese. And, yeah. No, go, go, go. Thank you, sister. Do you want to take one whole?